Um, James Carter is the vice president, practice lead of uh, water and environmental solutions with Octoform. Uh, James Carter has over 20 years of experience in senior sales and marketing roles in the construction and engineering products companies. Before joining Octoform, Mr. Carter led the technical and webinar programs for ArmTech, Canada's largest integrated construction and infrastructure projects company, offering solutions in bridges, infrastructure, drainage, and solutions for a broad range of utilities. James also has worked with several related companies that automate industrial processes with technology. These include AMI Global, a leader in IoT, cloud-based controls uh, for the water industry, and Wenco, a division at Hitachi, specializing in advanced solutions for mining automation to reduce cost carbon, to reduce costs, carbon emissions, and improve the safety of today's mines. Mr. Carter has held several industry and volunteer board positions and was previously the president of the International Internet Marketing Association. He has published numerous articles and publications and a sought after speaker on topics relating to integration and construction, industrial processes and technology transformation. Please join me in welcoming James for our afternoon session. Thanks very much. Thanks, James. I forgot we sent the wordy one over. Thanks very much. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I've a uh, very complete introduction, so I won't, won't uh, spend too much more time on that. We'll jump to today's uh, session. It, it is, there's an interactive component. So there's some, uh, uh, it's a little bit more complicated than Lego, but not that much more complicated there. So at the end, we'll build some tanks. Uh, we're actually gonna build some digesters, so. Um, so uh, Octiform uh, forms and protects uh, waste and containment tanks uh, in one step. Uh, so the, the major advantage uh, these days is, is, as everyone's probably aware, the cost of containment tanks is going up uh, significantly for, for glass line steel, uh, it, uh, as well as cast in place. Um, so Octiform is a, essentially a stay in place forming system. Uh, so, so the PVC does everything that uh, form work does. Uh, so miraculously, this, this tiny little layer of uh, 1.2 millimeters of PVC is actually lab tested to um, uh, about 1,000 PSF, which gives you a safety factor of three. You can pour concrete up to 80 feet and uh, four feet per hour continuous rate of pour. Uh, and, and you know, the, the blowout limit is much, much higher than that. Um, and, uh, and at the end of the day, you're left with a, a, a PVC lined concrete tank. Um, the liner on the inside has a special kind of joint, which we'll look at a little bit. Um, and that's uh, ex um, essentially tested at Intertech to 68 PSI, which is about 140 feet of, of water column pressure. And I'm pretty sure we're the only tank uh, available in the market today that, that offers a 20 year warranty in the presence of H2S. So we've got over 200 biogas tanks uh, in service worldwide. Um, uh, sorry, 200, about 200 tanks in service that are now approaching 19 years in, in service. Uh, in Germany alone, they're all performing as new. Um, so the PVC is obviously inert to uh, H2S and, and uh, you know, eliminates the, the risk of corrosion. Uh, we, we, we're always conservative when we're in front of en engineering audiences. We think it'll probably go to 40 years before they need a reline. Uh, but, uh, you know, you could probably assign like a 30-year a service life. And then we actually have a reline system that we provide as well. So that's a uh, high level. We'll jump into it a little bit. Uh, I, my bio has been, uh, been done. So... Um, so um, uh, what uh, I guess what uh, and over the last 20 years, Octoform has been embraced by industries uh, striving to affect positive change in terms of the, the way they build, uh, generate food, uh, grow and obviously uh, contain uh, water and, and, uh, and effluent as well. Uh, what began simply as a way to better to build uh, better has evolved to, to be a way to build for a better world. Um, so we're very proud of the, the markets we're in. Uh, we do a lot of biogas. Uh, we built some of the largest land based aquaculture projects. Uh, or actually, we, we are have built built most of the world's largest uh, land-based aquaculture projects. So, in North America, it's not really as as well known in industry, but some of these projects are equivalent to a, a very large municipal wastewater plant. The one we're building in Iceland right now is uh, 96 tanks, all 96 foot diameter by 29 feet high, um, and uh, and they have very kind of constrained resources generally to uh, implement a project like that. And we're able to support them to essentially execute these tanks in parallel. So they're doing like in three, they're putting a tank in every three weeks using essentially crews of six in parallel. And then next year they're gonna to move to putting uh, 
uh, four tanks in, in, in the ground every three weeks. Um, and we have uh, kind of the process and expertise to support that all over the world. So 80% of the crews that are installing Octaform have never seen it before. Um, and we have a business process that, process that supports that. We have a, a quality and certification process to make sure we certify and warranty the tanks at the end of the day as well. So we hired the the most picky senior um, quality guy we could find out of AECOM. Uh, and he's, he's scary. Uh, and that's a good thing. And uh, he turned away a truck last week in Iceland actually just said, nope, that's not coming to here. And so he'll monitor the concrete design to the nth degree. And if it's not right, it's not getting poured. And, uh, so yeah, that's been a, been a definitely been an additive thing for us as we look to some of these projects that are just, just massive in scale. So um, the re main reason we get selected on those types of projects is, is, uh, is the construction efficiency. There's no, there's not really any other system available to, to build anything that big that quickly. Um, you know, even with glass line steel, there's constraints now on, on lead times up to 18 months. And then uh, even when you build, you tend to have to build um, in, par in, in, in series. So even if they deliver enough tanks, they tend to have constraints on their labor to actually install. So they'd still be installing kind of every three weeks, a similar speed, but um, not in parallel. So, um, so yeah, we, we got about 400 uh, tanks in service worldwide and, and biogas uh, in particular. Um, as I mentioned, some of the German ones are some of the oldest ones. Those are around 19 years. So, um, and uh, and we got a big range of applications. Or if you can, on the screen, you can see kind of some some of our first applications were actually in agriculture. Uh, so we built a lot of barns in the Midwest, and that was like kind of the first application was just structural formwork. Um, and then the uh, what the owners noticed is they got that they were looking for something that was easily washable, uh, so they could power wash it. Uh, obviously, hygiene is a major concern. Um, and, and PVC is very smooth. That's why they use, you know, similar compound and PEX piping uh, to, to avoid any biofilm accumulation. Similarly, in food processing facilities, it's specified for similar reasons. They want to make sure there's no pathogen accumulation on the walls. If you put a power washer to it or a chemical to it, it all comes off. Uh, it doesn't accumulate. So, so that was the kind of initial rationale for building the barns these way this way. But you also have the thermal mass of the concrete inside of the EPS foam with very low thermal bridging. So they, they were surprised they ended up getting a lot better uh, performance uh, for the for the animals. So they get uh, essentially better rates of growth uh, because uh, if they're heat stressed, they don't they don't grow. Um, there's similar uh, concerns in, in, in certain uh, biological processes as well. So by digesters, uh, no surprise there. If, if you can kind of have better th thermal performance, you're going to get better throughput. Uh, so we do a lot of AD tanks um, uh, all over the world as well. And similar reports, uh, a lot of them are done by private, private stakeholders. So they won't tell you exactly how well they're doing. They'll just tell you that they're getting a little more throughput than they expected from their design. Um, they're usually pretty careful about what they tell you because it's all, a lot of what we do on that side is private. Uh, and and uh, so they're pretty low key about it, but, but we're getting good feedback there. So um, shortly after those, uh, those barns, which we probably started in the Midwest, as I mentioned, over 25 years ago, um, the U.S. EPA started having groundwater ingress issues because the U.S. Uh, farms are so big um, and they were getting groundwater contamination. Um, and so they were looking for a solution uh, for large manure containment. And, uh, and so we've done a lot of those and we got really good support from the U.S. NRCS on those tanks. That actual tank there has been in service now for about 18 years. It has three separate el electronically monitored sumps. Uh, they've never had an alarm. Uh, and uh, it's sitting right on top of a protected uh, trout habitat, a red hill from a protected trout habitat, and a, and a protected aquifer is right underneath it. So um, there were major concerns from the EPA, of course, with that site. Um, and that's about 240 foot diameter. Sorry, I've been talking to Americans for a long time, so I'll I'll try and get my uh, my my uh, metric going here. But um, uh, that's about 240 feet diameter and about uh, uh, 14 feet high. So um, in terms of range of heights, as I mentioned, we go all the way up to 80 feet. Um, pretty much any any tank that's large, likely we're going to be cost effective. Uh, if you're getting to really small diameter, where you could ship a fiberglass tank to site uh, and put it up in a couple of days, then uh, you know likely that's that's would be our kind of lower limit for sure. Um, so uh, so this is a, an interesting design. One of the things I think that's really interesting if uh, if you have unique designs uh, with respect to you know your your process design. Pretty much everything we've seen in aquaculture is is at least as complex as wastewater, and certainly uh, significantly more complex than biogas in terms of the types of penetrations we see, the types of designs we see, and um, uh, this is a, a very kind of bottom corner of a large 
uh, array of tanks for a land-based aquaculture project in, in uh, Northern Norway. Um, and they use this octagonal design because they end up using the, um, the kind of interstitial corners as filter basins. Uh, from an overall standpoint, sometimes people look at it on the outside and they say, well, that must be more efficient. You've got common wall construction, but there's also considerations. Uh, we usually would study it and decide what, what's better. Um, you know, obviously because of hoop strength being a governing factor with, with round tanks, uh, they're fairly efficient to build round. And if you have any straight walls, you tend to have more moment force on the kind of the center of the wall. And so that will, um, that will mean that you end up with thicker concrete there. So it's kind of, it's about even. You get some common wall construction advantage, but you also get thicker walls. So, uh, so sometimes people ask that question. Um, and again, in the aquaculture market, uh, they're very, uh, all the way up to the, you know, the, invest, the institutional investors, they're very concerned about biofilm accumulation and, and contamination for the, the species. And so that's been a major driver in that industry. Similarly, in, in, uh, you know, in, any kind of, um, um, in any kind of application where you're holding, uh, we are NSF potable, so any application where you're holding water for human consumption or even animal consumption, um, you know, it's good to know that, that uh, you're not going to get a lot of biofilm accumulation. So if you did need to clean, service the tank for some reason, there's some algae, um, it's, it's very easy to service, um, but uh, unlikely to accumulate anyway. So under a microscope PVC, extruded PVC, it may look like it's got about the same um, uh, roughness coefficient as say a, a coated concrete tank with a, uh, an epoxy liner, but it's about four times smoother. So on the roughness coefficient, there's extruded PVC is very, um, uh, has a very uh, low roughness coefficient. So. Um, there's pretty much on, on any project um, you know, that might be looking, a company might be looking at, or a group might be looking at in wastewater. There's a, a big range of applications uh, that that you might be considered. Uh, obviously, the o obvious ones are anywhere where there's corrosion risk, um, and uh, you know, due to due to H2S, etc., um, or anywhere where there's uh, concerns about you know potable water and biofilm biofilm accumulation. Um, the the other thing is is we'll look at later is, is seismic. Um, and, and any concerns about uh, cracking or leakage. Um, so PVC does work similar to some of the studies, if there's any structural engineers in the audience or um, with the structural engineers, there's a lot of uh, study done on, on columns, structural columns. And when you contain concrete, you significantly increase its, its performance. So, um, so uh, it increases the compressive strength, the flexural strength, and ultimately the seismic loading on the tanks. Um, so that's obviously a factor in, in coastal BC as well. Um, for sure. Um, and then finally is just total cost. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of success in, in smaller markets where the forms aren't readily available, they need to get shipped. Um, and, and we can reduce costs there and then, and then certainly schedule advantages. The schedule is cost. So uh, it's always important to study schedule context as well. You might get a, a line item from us and it's possible it's the same price. It doesn't seem to be that, that often, but um, uh, some, if you're building a, an array of tanks, say six tanks, likely there's not a cheaper way to do it. Um, and again, that's just because you can deploy fairly local, low skill labor um, and support it. Uh, and we can support it um, in terms of getting local contractors to bid. That's our job. We do a pretty good job with that. Um, so you're going to get, um, uh, you know, initially they're going to look at it and they're going to go if they haven't seen it before. This is new. But again, like 80 percent of our projects, the contractors never seen it before. Um, so we have a pretty good way of, of showing them, a, a you know, a takeoff illustration and then showing them time lapse and real time footage of of every kind of stage of the execution. And at the end, they kind of look at it and they can tell, oh, that's, that's not really skilled labor. And that's where they realize they can see dollar signs. There's always constraints on skilled labor if they can use a pretty high ratio of low skilled labor, uh, you know, and, and wreck something that, uh, that at the end, we're gonna take the onus on. So we also carry the warranty, uh, then, then that kind of reduces risk. So you end up getting fairly competitive pricing back from the contractors. Um, so yeah, a big range of applications we see. Um, uh, equalization ba basins, clarifiers, aeration basins, BNRs, uh, biosolids tanks, obviously, uh, anything in, in the digester space, aerobic and anaerobic, uh, potable water uh, storage, uh, even water towers, like the structural component for the water tower uh, works pretty well. So um, it's just very rapid to, uh, you to, uh, to build. Uh, so um, I'm just going to uh, show a quick kind of uh, assembly sequence here. So this is um, uh, essentially a formwork segment. The prerequisites are the same as a, as a uh, ACI 350 uh, tank um, or a, a, a ACI 350 structural design. 
Um, and so uh, essentially, um, the engineer is going to want to know a few things. They're obviously, that PVC, they're not used to saying that going through the concrete. Uh, so they're going to want to know, is it detractive in any way? And the, the answer is it's actually additive. And that's there's three separate studies. One's done at Seattle University. The other one's done at University of Waterloo. And the other one's done at the UBC Shake Table. So um, the concrete contains the, uh, the, the uh, octoporn contains the concrete. And, and that allows it to, um, uh, to, to not spall. Uh, and so it increases its compressive strength effectively. Finally, we put it on a, a four-point bending test at University of Waterloo. And that increases the flex and an octiform uh, specimen significantly exceeded the structural capacity of the um, uh, of the um, uh, of the control specimens uh, by about sixty five percent increase in yield load, uh, thirty five percent increase in cracking load, and then finally we put it on the shake table uh, with Dr. Carlos Ventura at UBC, um, and the control specimen failed at what's called Veritec times two hundred percent, which is like a Mexico City earthquake times two hundred. Sorry, I don't know how to pause this. That's why the video is still going. But, um, but, uh, uh, and then, um, oh, it's paused. No, thanks. Appreciate that. Um, uh, so, so yeah, we put that on, on the UBC on the shake table at UBC and the the control specimen, which was an ACI three hundred and fifty. Um, uh, was uh, sorry, it was an ACI three hundred and eighteen squat wall with a large opening in it, and then about ten thousand pounds of of steel sitting on top of it. It failed at Veritech times two hundred percent, which is uh, roughly speaking a magnitude eight and a half earthquake. And then they ran our specimen uh, up to two hundred and fifty percent, and they ran at multiple cyclic loads for thirty minutes. They couldn't break it. The university was kind of threatening to give us a big power bill. They said, "I think your test is done. You've proven your point." Uh, and they ground off corners um, to see where the kind of there was some additional deflection noted. And they ground off corners and they could they could see that it was sub eighth inch crack. So that means basically the difference between a catastrophic failure and and uh, and water containment structure continuing to, to operate as intended. Um, obviously, in, in addition to that eight, sub eighth inch crack, which per the code would mean likely no leakage if it was designed for ACI 350, you've got a highly ductile watertight permanent liner in front of it. So not only do you not have a, a have a structural issue or even a leakage issue, you have that ad additional kind of assurance there. So. Uh, we have seen a lot of uptake in uh, Western, you know, throughout Western Canada, down in the States, of course, because of that. Um, so, so that answers that question. They're going to design for the existing code. They're going to use the existing, you know, whatever water stop they require to use, they would use it. They would specify that. Um, for penetrations, we would just need a standard penetration plan. Uh, and then we would uh, use, uh, work with, um, uh, we've had Sika UWL through the lab. Uh, through the, we put our panel through their lab and they come back with like a substrate adhesion procedure uh, for the octiform and then uh, we're able to assure that sealants are installed correctly. So you just follow the substrate adhesion procedure for our panel and any other substrate you're put you're lapping it onto like a pipe or if you lap it onto the floor at the bottom then um, uh, then uh, there's a procedure obviously for the you know concrete to ensure adhesion. So um, I'm just gonna try and oh I see I do have control. Bear with me, folks. I'm, I'm learning. So I think if I hit go again, I can play. I have some assistance. Thank you. So, so the first thing that happens is that inside panel is, is what's called SLT or snap lock tight. So it's a watertight panel. This, uh, and then it'll go up against the bracing or the scaffolding. Uh, then the connectors go in. And then as you can see here, steel gets placed, uh, lifted, tied, and inspected. And then outside panels get slid in. Uh, if there's any foam, uh, any insulation specified, we we build a spec. So, you know, uh, four inches is pretty typical to get your R18. Uh, so for an anaerobic digester, we often see four inches, uh, in uh, you know, up in Canada. Um, and then the concrete is placed at a just continuous rate of pour, four feet per hour. They'll just run around the tank. Um, and uh, and this video is th this will be available after to anyone who wants it. Um, this sequence just continues and it shows kind of more detail in terms of how Octiform gets executed from a construction and efficiency standpoint. So it's very easy to, to kind of deploy crews in both directions, directing the formwork. Um, so you can take a six-person crew on, a say, a small um, small tank like that, and they're very well deployed and utilized. So uh, the, there's no kind of the, – the reason we're able to kind of work with new labor is that there's no uh, – it's there's, there's no – just like lean manufacturing, there's no pause points where all of a sudden – six people are standing there waiting for someone to do a pen deal with the penetration. 
you can just redeploy the labor in the opposite direction around the tank. They can pre-assign, assemble some panels, et cetera. So, uh, so there's no kind of major dead spots where, you know, some element of project risk becomes a, a major contributing factor in a scheduled delay or anything like that. So, um, and finally, obviously, after that bar is placed, again, you can see here, um, they're going to close up the forms, add the insulation, and place your concrete there. They're going four feet per hour. And there's some tricks in the mix. As I mentioned, we have a, a, a senior quality guy who's got um, way more letters behind his name than I do with respect to, to concrete certifications. And um, so obviously you want a very flowable mix going in there, uh, fairly small aggregate. Um, and so we, the engineer will give our, will be given our boundaries. Obviously the, the, the design will, concrete design will be per the engineer, um, but, uh, but we'll, have, we'll have to accept it. So we're included as, as kind of a signing authority to accept it, that it'll uh, support um, good consolidation at the Octiform. So um, uh, this is usually where we take a lot of questions. People kind of start to digest it. They've seen that sequencing. Now we're looking at the um, uh, at the formwork. So I'll, I'll, I'll pause for questions in a bit here. Um, so this is a, a typical uh, example. Uh, obviously, for, for typical tanks, you're going to see a much thicker form. This is probably an example of a six-inch wall form. So as you can see, it's got a single matter rebar. Those little rectangles in the middle are quite small um, in, uh, in a typical tank. Uh, we, we kind of provide the, that center uh, connector in two inch increments, all the way up to 26 inches in, in wall thickness. Um, you're gonna see a lot more of that gray area, lots of room for double mats at bar. Uh, the outside actually is, is quite useful, actually, depending on, on whether you got your um, uh, horizontals on the inside or the outside, it can uh, help ensure that the depth of cover is met because uh, it's exactly two inches always. So as the formwork gets bigger, that center rectangle gets much, much larger and it's, uh, you'll see lots of pictures later where it accommodates. Um, uh, double mats. Obviously, you can see, uh, depending on what kind of horizontal bar pattern you have, there may be some collisions. It's actually fairly limited. It's only about an inch thick, that little strapping. Um, so uh, three inch bar patterns can be a bit challenging. Um, so we provide some, some guidance to the engineer. Typically, because as you go up in height, your pressure decreases, it's okay to run three inch bar pattern for a bit. You know, potentially it means you're using a little bit extra bar, but you know, only in the first six feet of the tank or something like that. So but usually we can work with them to come up with something that's going to be, you know, uh, work well. Uh, as I mentioned, the water stop is per design. Uh, the inside panel is, is the uh, watertight panel system. Uh, so that's the panel, the system that we warranty for uh, for 20 years as being watertight, um, including corrosion resistant for H2S, et cetera. Um, and number five there, again, wall thickness is for all the way from four inches to 24 inches in two, in two inch increments. Um, so if you, your structural design specifies something where you end up with an extra inch, usually we'll either fill it with foam or, uh, or usually you can value engineer a little bit. So if you're using more concrete, you, sometimes you're a little bit less, um, uh, less demand on the horse, on the vertical bars. Uh, so, you know, adding an inch of concrete isn't the end of the world. So. Um, and fairly standard uh, concrete mix design requirements. We just need to increase the slump with a plasticizer to make sure it flows in nicely. We get really good consolidation, um, and um, and we tend to use a little bit smaller aggregate sizes. So, uh, so it's usually any jurisdiction, whether they're referencing ACI 350 or they're referencing Euro code or the British structural codes, there's there's no issue getting uh, uh, getting something working with with the engineers. So, yeah. Yeah, good question. Yeah, so uh, we one of the things we do is um, uh, obviously we're there and we and we supervise and we certify. So we'll the, really the the key is is the mix, and so uh, we will have continuous monitoring on the mix, and then we'll want that as soon as the we'll want the plasticizer added on site, and 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 unless there's kind of different sometimes when the temperatures vary, uh, it, the it, the plasticizer can last longer. So colder temps it takes a little bit longer for the plasticizer to go out of the mix. Uh, but typically our default right in our, our warranty spec and, and what our, our uh, technical supervisor is looking for is to place it within 40 minutes. Um, and then the other thing is the aggregate size we're looking for is a max 3 8 inch. Uh, and if they do that well, uh, and they're watching what's actually coming out of the hose, then, uh, then, then we're, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, they are gonna obviously vibrate and they're gonna overlap the, the lifts uh, in the, with the vibrator. 
and it sounds very low tech. Uh, and uh, but you know, even we all know what engineers say, and 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 how you ensure quality in the field can be sometimes a little different. Even engineers acknowledge this. We got guys on the ground with rubber mallets, and it's only one mil thick, so they can tap tap tap, and if they see a void and they catch a void, they can run the vibrator back through it, and that you know that's it catches ninety. Pretty much all of it. Um, the main issue you have is when you got a large, large penetration, like a uh, you know digester. Sometimes they have a man manway that's going to be three feet wide. Um, a lot of times they'll put a little, there'll be a little hole in the manway when you're pouring, so that the doesn't you don't get cavitation in there with the air or an air pocket. Um, and they'll want to see the concrete come up to there, but you can still have areas where you need to go back and cure after, just like regular concrete. So um, so we'll kind of uh, you know we'll do a leak test. That's part of our requirement uh, if there is a leak. Uh, that doesn't mean a failed warranty. Uh, it means we're going to work with them to, to perform some injections, just like you regularly would. Uh, and then as long as there's a three-day condition where they have sub 1% uh, loss or 0.1% loss, I can't remember, I'm going to look at the number again, uh, of, of level, then we would warranty the tank as being watertight, and then it, we carry the responsibility for it for 20 years. So it is a bit, a bit different because, no, you can't look at the concrete. Um, but it, we, we found that if you have the right people most of the reasons most of the reasons concrete actually does what it does people know the root cause after which is kind of interesting so it means it means that they, they, they can tell you why it did that based on the mix design they can tell you why it did that based on lack of vibration they could you know the idea that it just magically goes that wrong it's not the case it's, it's that someone was tired it was 11 o'clock at night they were trying to finish the pour in one day it came out of the hose all clumpy and they're like yeah you know what on second thought it came out of the hose all clumpy that was actually the last one i saw Literally, and that was the last time I ever said in our in our company. This is about five years ago now. I said that we're ever not going to have a field guy on site, and a it's the whole kind of the joke. It's not our fault, but it's our problem. So, uh, so that you know, we 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 our field guy left, and then like two hours later, the concrete the contractor was pouring, you know, not it it didn't look like um it didn't look like milkshake. Let's put it that yeah. way. Uh, that's about fifty fifty. So, so because uh, a couple of things, one is people who understand the mix really well, the mix we, that we specify uh, has very low probability of any kind of segregation and that's well acknowledged, but not everyone's comfortable with that. Their interpretation of the code can vary. Um, but if you're doing, you know, usually up to 20 feet, uh, we'll often uh, see people free fall it because the octiform um, contains it. So you don't get scatter anyway. So that's one of the major causes of segregation. The other one is certain types of mix are more likely to segregate. But uh, you know that that mix that that um, with that amount of plasticizer in it and that aggregate size is is fairly well acknowledged to, to not segregate. So um, so we will try to work with the engineer to get them to free fall because it helps the schedule. If they can't, then we can accommodate a tremie anyway. So uh, either or, it's usually about thirty percent of the time they're saying no, I want a tremie in there based on the local engineer. Good questions, thanks. So I presume that you have to fairly continuous pour like you can't have cold joints, right? Yeah, I, I mean, we, we try to avoid them for sure. Yeah, I mean, you can't, um, you know, if, if, you know, a minor cold joint or a rock pocket doesn't equal a leak. So if the engineer, you know, says this is fine from a structural standpoint, we've got a permanent liner in front of it. So it does mitigate risk. But, you know, typically we're, we're trying to pour the whole tank in one go. Um, obviously, there's certain types of designs where you're going to need to be you're going to need to accommodate a, a cold joint like a 80 foot tank. They're not going to, they may not necessarily pour that all in one go. So uh, we are kind of looking at some pretty high digesters now, like we're doing a couple 18 meter digesters coming up in the US. So those will probably, we'll need to plan for a cold joint in there somewhere. Yeah. Good question. Questions? So I, I, I'll take some from the, if there's anyone remote, just let us know and we'll, we'll take capture some questions from them as well. Okay, great. Uh, so just uh, going back to this, uh, this diagram we have here, um, I, I think that pretty much covers, it, covers off everything um, uh, in, the, in the system itself. Uh, so these are the components. Um, so as mentioned that, that inner, uh, uh, the reason you maybe haven't seen this, we, we have, have about 96 patents for PVC formwork. So you can see PVC formwork used in various markets for structural formwork, but we're pretty much the only one in containment. Um, 
anyway, this this um, there's a patented system that that uh, zips together those those um, uh, those SLT panels as we call them, and that system's lab tested to 68 psi uh, at Intertech, uh, which is about 140 feet water column pressure as I mentioned. So that zipper on the on the far right there, top right, um, that essentially runs on on two grooves in the panel and forces that panel uh, forces that seam shut. And once it's shut, you can't uh, you can't uh, you can't move it. Uh, they also also the it's very easy to very easy to use. So we we get kind of consistent results in the field. Um, and uh, and then uh, the insulation obviously can be extruded to thickness. And then finally, the outside panel is that one on the top left. And that one literally just slides down. It's almost gravity fed. Um, so on the inside, you're kind of taking uh, sections of panel and you're zipping them together uh, and, and bracing them up against the uh, the scaffolding. Uh, and on the outside, you're literally they're taking what looks like quite a flexible panel and they're putting it over their shoulder uh, and and into the connector. And then uh, it's funny when it's in all in opposition. It's it's a very rigid uh, system. So uh, that's just a co kind of a cross section of that. Um, uh, SLT panel, so you can see that uh, in that in that joint detail there, uh, there's there's essentially two contact points, and it's co-extruded with a softer PVC, uh, and that's what makes that that watertight uh, connection there. Um, coincidentally, our, our first digesters we ever did uh, were actually with our standard system. Uh, it's just that we couldn't, we, it would never test out in the lab to be watertight. In reality, um, it's performing as if it's watertight, gas tight. In, in the field because you get so much head pressure when you load it with concrete, those joints come quite tight. Um, but uh, obviously we needed something that was would provide a little bit more uh, confidence for engineers. Um, and uh, and so that, that system obviously it stands on its own even without any concrete behind it uh, as being watertight. So it's essentially braced up with uh, with just lumber and then Intertech ran a gasket at a, a large uh, kind of um, uh, uh, hose to it and, and then ran a lot of water pressure against it, obviously. So, um, this is a University of Waterloo test. Uh, this is a four point bending test. Um, and it's uh, uh, the control specimen. Uh, we exceeded the, the performance of the control specimen, which is an ACI 318 code reference specimen uh, by 65% increase in yield load and 36% increase in cracking load. Um, structural engineers are pretty comfortable with this kind of stuff because there's a lot of study done on FRP uh, for column jacketing and uh, to increase uh, basically uh, seismic uh, capacity of, of uh, structural columns uh, and even blast uh, blast uh, resistance. And so this is fairly similar to what they're used to seeing, which is you can take a highly ductile material that on its own isn't that strong. Uh, and if it contain, can do a reasonable job of containing concrete, it significantly increases its capacity. So the main mode of failure, obviously, with concrete, eventually it does kind of decide where it's going to go and then it'll spall. And so it, it limits that spalling. So, um, uh, so no surprise. Just with a standard compressive st uh, strength test, we had a thirty-six, a thirty percent increase in confinement uh, due to confinement. Um, and then we put it on the shake table at UBC, uh, and the control specimen. Uh, that one up top. It's, it's the only reason it's not in, in, you know, in shards on the ground is that it's it's cable stayed uh, because it would tear apart the lab pretty badly if it actually collapsed. Um, but that's a complete failure. You can see there's there's uh, spalling at the top there. Uh, there's spalling in the middle, and then there's spalling at the hinge at the bottom, which is a pretty common mode of failure in seismic. Things start going like this with concrete. It doesn't like it. It spalls out at the hinge. Um, and then the bottom is the octiform. They ran that to what was called Veritech time 250, um, and, uh, and they ran it for half an hour, and they didn't get any kind of major... Uh, they saw, saw some deflection. You can see it's got radar detectors on it, or I don't know what you call those, but similar to what, what they put on crash test dummies. And uh, so they did uh, detect some additional deflection. At a certain point, there was a bit of a curve there. And so they opened it up and they saw kind of eighth and sub eight, uh, sub eighth inch cracks, which is kind of considered uh, business as usual. It would still be center, considered um, likely retain water. And obviously with the octaform in front of it, it would, would retain water. So but there's some additional service life uh, considerations you guys might want to consider. When you, when you don't strip form work, normally you're planning on stripping it within a couple of weeks. Uh, if you leave it in place, the concrete continues to cure. So typically, you're going to see hardness increases about thirty uh, percent. We've we've had people had to pull a core later, uh, and we saw you know sixty eight hundred psi where they're expecting forty four hundred. So um, so obviously, if you just leave the formwork in there, it's going to continue to cure. Uh, the other thing, other than our major concerns in wastewater, which are like H two S and you know you know anything any chemical that might be quite quite aggressive, you know the long term service life you know, failure of, of a, any concrete structure is due to 
essentially um, drying shrinkage, cracking, then you get capillarization, which is, you know, you know, you get capillaries right into the bars. And then you get the oxygen to the rebar, rebar expands, creates spalling and failure. So um, if you can um, continue to delay that onset of drying shrinkage, uh, then, then it really maintains the service life of your structure. So we haven't assigned any value to that, but we certainly get nods from consulting engineers that that, that likely is at least 10 years on the service life uh, of the structure. And, and uh, we don't seem to, you know, we kind of slowly venture out and everyone just kind of nods. So I guess, I, you know, I guess that's a pretty safe bet uh, from, uh, from that standpoint. Um, we haven't really gotten too aggressive on that one because, you know, primarily people are looking at, you know, more, you know, more near term concerns, but uh, certainly something to consider. Um, and we've got a uh, handful of tests I've already covered off. So it is NSF potable. Uh, we, we did that pre prior to PFAS and PFOA concerns. So um, we're now, um, we've, we've now had subsequent letters uh, from our extruders and from the, the pellet supplier on the PVC. There's zero PFAS or PFOA there. So obviously if we put stuff into service, we wanna make sure we're, we're solving that problem and not contributing to it. Um, and same thing in our other uh, areas of our business, um, you know, ag, you know, they're putting, you know, digestates going out and getting spread on fields after. So we want to make sure it's, it's, it's doing its job and same thing in aquaculture. So um, it is class A fire. So you can do, you know, common wall construction in certain areas and other buildings where there's some corrosion or some other pumping equipment, which you might have chlorides or what have you. Uh, it's a pretty efficient way to build if you're already building. You know, I don't know that we'd necessarily stack up against concrete block, but if you already have a contractor there building a tank, then then we're going to come in pretty cost effective. Um, in colder markets in, in BC, uh, certainly in the U.S. Midwest, we do get specified quite a bit for for buildings because of the thermal performance. So um, uh, so uh, so we do see that the combination of obviously the uh, you know chloride resistance or what have you in the building and the thermal performance seems to work well uh, for additional buildings. Um, Sometimes we have questions about, about PVC and UV. Uh, we've all seen those buildings where there's like a, you know, there's like a, a uh, you know, they just look terrible. And, and the, the chances are, if, if, you see, if you've seen any of that in recent memory, that building's probably already 40 years old. Um, the, the PVC market's gotten a little more sophisticated. So there's a, a lot of, uh, high, you know, fairly high degree of stabilizers in there. Uh, we do use this application. We are specified by a Florida DOT to, to wrap column jackets and that's tropical. Uh, we have uh, tanks in service in Saudi Arabia for an aquaculture project. They've been in service 20 years, uh, or sorry, 10 years now. Uh, they don't even look yellow on the outside, so that's usually a good sign. Um, and then the important thing to remember long term is, is uh, you know, likely on the on the inside of your tank, you're, you, you know, you still have a concrete tank. So, you know, if, if you did, you know, we, we have them in Australia and New Zealand as well. So we did tell them, we're like, we're not going to make any promises about this market. There's no ozone layer there. So, you know, probably after 10 years, you know, they can factor in that they may use a, there's special coatings that, that have very good adhesion to PVC uh, and they're UV reflective. So they would, they would factor like after 10 years. But in Canada, you know, we've had tanks already in service for 20 years. We expect to probably be 40 plus before they would ever see any yellowing on that PVC. Um, I saw a few people kind of perk up there. Uh, any questions on, on certifications or some of the studies we did covered off? I know it's, it's afternoon and it's warm here, so can't blame you guys. Um, in terms of construction execution, I think I covered that pretty adequately. This is kind of cool. This is actually the world's largest recirculating aquaculture project at the time. That one in Iceland we're doing is now the biggest. Uh, so that's a couple billion dollar project. Um, and uh, it's pretty pretty interesting one. Uh, but this is in Saudi. Uh, we didn't know that everyone would entirely speak Arabic and none of our crew spoke Arabic, uh, but we're, we're really darn good at hand signals. Uh, and yeah, so they, they were on time on budget and um, uh, yeah, and I would say even kind of some of the usual things we're used to seeing the, the tools weren't, you know, there weren't as many power tools on the job site, let's put it that way. And, um, and, and then we still had them kind of pretty efficient you know, on time on budget on that project. Pretty happy about that. Um, and, uh, and that was like just a really large shrimp, shrimp producer. It's since been eclipsed several times over. Um, and then that, that one in Iceland is, is bigger than anything that's been kind of taken on so far. Um, yeah, obviously, it ships flat. So uh, anytime you can put something into service that has, you know, is going to extend the life of concrete, uh, that's probably the biggest impact you're going to get from a, 
um, uh, from, a, from a life cycle advantage there. So if you can extend the service life by 10 years, uh, there's a ton of uh, GHG emissions in every ton of concrete. So um, uh, in terms of you know shipping, obviously it's, we're shipping flat, you're not hauling stuff back and forth um, and, uh, and it's just getting cast in and, and, and away you go. Um, obviously reducing your main, uh, potential maintenance intervals and downtime. So you're not doing any midlife servicing. You're not, you don't have to peel out. You don't have to be confronted with a polyurethane coating that, that then fails. And then you need to do big surface, uh, prep, uh, uh, and then reapplication. Uh, we actually have a system coincidentally, uh, that, that actually covers that, um, uh, does a better job of, of, of kind of rehabbing tanks, which we can look at in a little more detail as well. Um, and, and you can see this is like all over the world. So this is, this is in uh, Nunavut. Uh, that's a, a um, wastewater plant in Nunavut. Um, uh, bottom right corner is Fukushima, Japan. Uh, obviously, we all know what happened there. So for a while on Google Earth, all you could see was our tanks. Everything else was, was gone, unfortunately. Um, and they're still holding water. Uh, needless to say, there's, they're not harvesting fish there, unfortunately. But, uh, but yeah, good testament to kind of the, them doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, not huge head height, so I mean, not not surprising that that, that they held up, but uh, nonetheless interesting. Uh, from a construction constructability standpoint, this just kind of shows how straightforward it is. You can see that's like a small agriculture uh, uh, tank, and they're just putting up. They're just basically bent to radius a six inch plywood strip at the top, and they're just attaching that SLT panel to it. He's in the middle of sliding those connectors down uh, for that first kind of construction sequence. So. Um, Pretty much any any wall can be accommodated. We've done lots of straight walls as well. So um, penetrations, there's different things done. Obviously, we're used to seeing heating coils and digesters. Uh, straight wall segments are done a little differently. You can see they've basically pre-assembled all these segments, and then they're going to get put in place. Um, and uh, so it's done a little differently. So same outcome, though. You can always have access to tie-off bars. You can always have access to inspect. They, those panels just slide up, so pretty easy to get in there. Um, bottom right corner is Paris, California. That's zone, zone four seismic. That's CRNR waste services. It's uh, the largest uh, um, food waste digester, uh, ICNI and food waste digester in North America. They do 335,000 tons a year. Uh, it's a straight wall. So it's a containment tank and a zone four seism seismic and it's straight wall. So it's got huge moment, uh, you know, forces uh, were the kind of governing concern on that, on that long wall run. And, um, uh, and the engineer's quite happy with Octoform. As you can see, we can accommodate tons of steel. I mean, those are all, uh, some of those are one inch bars. So, um, so yeah, there's, there's lots of, and they're, and in some cases they're doubled in some areas. So uh, as you get to the center of the wall and, you know, huge, huge, uh, I think one and a quarter inch on the, on the verticals in some areas. So um, uh, the other, the other thing is if you've got complex projects, uh, a lot of the stuff is done just braced internally. So you can do zero clearance applications, less excavating, uh, obviously, just just different site considerations can be accommodated. We're pretty, um, you know, for a vendor that essentially sells former, trying to punch above our weight. We like to get involved, and and if there's any execution planning, we can get involved in earlier. Look at the whole master schedule. Uh, we got pretty experienced guys, and, and we're going to find opportunities to to find value for you guys for your project for your schedule. Um, kind of you know uh, above and beyond. Like I said, our our mentality is kind of like it's that joke is like it's not our fault, but it's our problem. When we know construction problems happen, we try to stay way ahead of them. So we run our own risk register. We run, you know, uh, weekly planning with the um, weekly uh, execution planning with the contractor. Uh, it doesn't matter whether they're PCL or, you know, any of the big guys and they, you know, it doesn't matter if they, they appear to, to have everything, you know, dot, you know, down to the, every, everything's nailed. Uh, we're still going to, you know, be there every step of the way to just make sure that, that and, and that they're happy to do it because at the end of the day, uh, we transfer a warranty to the, we extend a warranty, which they transfer to the owner. Uh, so they're happy to, you know, to coordinate with us. So most of the major contractors are pretty, pretty thrilled to, to work with us and uh, we get it done. So, um, uh, and sorry to name drop there, but uh, just as an example, uh, lots of great contractors we work, work with in BC. Um, and, uh, and, um, and we're certainly happy to, uh, to do so. And, and we like the, we like working with them. So. Um, in terms of concrete placement, we pretty much, talked about that. They're going to just kind of use a pendulum motion and, and kind of build a hill of pressure across the cells. I, that's ideally what we want to see. Obviously, sometimes they do demand a tremie. The engineer, local engineer will say, no, I want to see a tremie in there. Um, and that's fine. So you can drop a tremie down and, and place it, uh, you know, with the, the whatever the maximum required drop is, five feet or whatever. And um, 
uh, and then they're going to obviously vibrate. Uh, you'll have uh, the power wash as they go to make sure there's no adhesion to the PVC. And then they're going to use a, a rubber mallet and they're going to just be checking all as concrete's getting placed, see what level they're landing at. And obviously if there's any voids and they're going to run the vibrator back through it. Um, this is this wall armor system. So um, this was developed over 10 years ago. It was used actually in two, pla two places uh, recently in Canada, or, or just the ones I can think of. The, it was used to reline a hydrolysis tank, uh, which we'll look at. Was, they had a bag liner, it ruptured completely. Uh, they then uh, tried to reline it with polyurethane. They had an adhesion problem, it failed. And then they came back and they were looking at doing it again with polyurethane or the octoform. And we were gonna be two weeks ahead of schedule and about $20,000 less total cost to do it. Uh, so they that owner uh, decided to go with Octiform. Uh, they've just done another project uh, where they've done a reline using that. Uh, needless to say, all their other tanks are just Octiform now. So that kind of solves that problem. Uh, they've all uh, the, this one's been in the, the one tank I'm thinking was been in service about eight years. Um, no issues there. And then the other one we did is we used the same system to reline a bunch of potash terminals in um, for Neptune. Uh, that had major corrosion. The tunnels with the conveyor belts, they had major corrosion because they had you know, air and the moisture in the air and potash is pretty corrosive. Um, they were really kind of not sure. It was a relatively new system at the time. So they asked us to extrude it all in transparent to make sure that they had good consolidation behind it. And, and it, uh, you know, we, we, we worked with them on the mixed spec and we got great consolidation in there. So there's lots of, um, lots of pictures of basically transparent, um, uh, the, the system done in transparent. It's a little different system because it needs to go floor to ceiling without any interruption. Um, so, uh, so it's a push on system. So you push on a panel and then in between each panel, a ceiling strip gets pushed in there. And just based on the way the, the PVC is extruded, once you load it, it's, uh, uh, it's essentially watertight um, and corrosion resistant. Oh, no, sorry. You, 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 you drill a, a hole in the end and you run a grout into it to fill the void. Yeah, so that was why uh, that was why they wanted that uh, they wanted it in transparent because they wanted to see whether or not they were going to end up with voids. So um, so this is a this is in Sea Cliff, Ontario. So you can see polyurethanes just peeled off in sheets. So this is round three, and we're putting on on the octaform. And you can see we're just putting it on right over. There's no surface prep required. Uh, the 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 adhesion is actually just mechanical anchoring from the connectors not needing adhesion on the wall on, on the concrete so it's a, essentially it is a cold joint the entire thing's a cold joint uh, but it's the the mechanical anchoring of the connectors with the hilti bolts um is what uh, what does it yeah oh yeah good question yeah. so the uh, the question was um what prevents water uh, ingress at the at the floor seam uh, so for a typical tank, um, you know, with you know water containment, you, your your kind of rules are the same. So uh, so you're gonna obviously you're gonna rely on a good water stop design. When you're placing concrete right down near the water stop, there's there's extra things going on. You, in addition to the water stop, sometimes you have your your lapped um, uh, dowels uh, lapped to your 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 vertical bars. So there's actually more issues there, and it needs to perform better there. So typically you want to watch your mix design. Make sure you're pouring a really nice thin mix down there. Um, and, and you can also use a crystalline admix. Um, because the whole thing's watertight, you don't need crystalline in the balance of it, but crystalline admix at that first lift is really good because it makes sure that if there is a minor issue around the water stop, it's gonna just cure itself most of the time. Obviously there's always issues that could, could occur at the water stop. So for typical water containment, and some people would even submit that even for digesters, that's, that's probably adequate. So uh, good water stop design, uh, good mix design and crystalline. Uh, because most of the actual corrosion that's happening is happening up in the gas zone. When you think about like digesters and, and manure, and depends on, the, on what kind of uh, what kind of digestate you're talking about, tends to be it'll tend to like plug it. So most of the real really bad corrosion you're talking about is happening in the gas zone. Um, obviously, with with um, public infrastructure, people are a little more cautious. Some of that kind of more goes to private. So they're likely if you say, okay, well, what else? They're and we say, well, you can use Sika EWL. Uh, trial grade, which is a, a special kind of aggressive environment version of Sika um, that's been adhesion tested for Octiform. And they would typically lap that up 15 centimeters up the wall system. And they would use what's called the heel bead. So it's like about two inches thick right at the at the joint. And then they would lap that onto the concrete floor. Um, and then in some cases, there's a, you know some assessment done and and you need, the, you need that polyurethane coating across the entire floor as well. So you could lap it right across. Depends on, again, what you're, you know, what, what's going on and how aggressive the environment is. So. 
Um, so I think that's pretty much it. Uh, in terms of cases, uh, I kind of mentioned this before. Uh, this one was also um, uh, about up, kind of uphill from a trout habitat. Uh, this is about 240 foot diameter, 16 foot high wall um, and sitting on top of a protected aquifer. Uh, and so that was US EPA. Uh, it was big to get that manure tank done. Um, we do do uh, aeromods, a common design there. I noticed there is an aeromod rep here. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this design. It's a common small water, uh, small market wastewater design um, that we see a lot in the Midwest. Um, and we had, uh, that was erected by six guys in six days. Um, and when, when I was down there, there was this, this engineer named McClure and, and he was on the phone to his buddy and he, or his colleague and he says, no, no, it's, yeah, it's still holding. Now I'm waiting, I'll let you know. And, and obviously they'd all talked amongst themselves. And even though they were convinced enough to specify us, they still expected it to blow out. So they were all amazed when it didn't. So pretty funny, but um, uh, just, just, you know, because we all know uh, and everything doesn't go exactly as planned. So usually we're, if we're dealing with major contractors, they're gonna ask us, okay, yeah, yeah, fine. What happens if it does? Well, if it does, remember it's all six inch cells. It, the, the, they're very limited in scope. It's not like you lose, you lose all your concrete. You just have, you'll have maybe a creaking crack, crack up, a, uh, up a panel. And so you can actually just uh, basically drill a hole to, to get it to stop creeping. And then you can put another panel on side, you know, put some screws in it and it's done. You're not, you know, you're not losing, you're not losing the pour. So uh, it's not like some of the blowouts that you see in, in other kind of infrastructure problem projects. Um, so obviously, um, uh, you know, fairly complex uh, with forming, you'd, you'd have a sequencing issue there uh, where you'd likely, you know, you'd likely have to kind of uh, cure uh, weight. You'd have some vertical cold joints in there that you needed to put, uh, uh, you needed to deal with, uh, with this. They just, they basically set the whole thing up, braced it all out and poured in a day. So, uh, so yeah, they, uh, they were way ahead of schedule on that system, so. Um, we talked about that one. Sorry, we got a. Am I going the wrong way? Yep. According to my mouse, I'm not. Hang tight. Uh, this is a, a neat one. This is a Stantec project. Uh, it's Tabor, Alberta. It's a BNR bioreactor. Um, they were estimating it'd be about 56 days minimum to get this done. Uh, they used a, a sub there that's quite good. He's actually a trainer for us now. We have him out in Iceland. Uh, and he's got those guys moving pretty quickly. And they have kind of a rotating cast of, uh, they have to, um, it's really hard to get consistent labor resource there. So it's really difficult. Um, so they're they're facing some challenges and and he's getting everyone moving. But um, so he he was the sub for for Stantec for this project, and um, uh, it predates me. So I was on a on a lunch and learn with with that Stantec office, and one of the people was there, and I said, "Do I have my numbers correct? Did, did he actually get it done in 26 days?" Said, oh yeah, so that was fast. So they were expecting about 56. They were done in, in and out of there in 26 days, and that included a tornado going through and knocking some of it over uh, during the uh, during the uh, setup. So. Uh, main reason uh, that they're able to go go quickly, obviously, uh, you know, good contractor. Uh, the other thing was that they poured a lot of it, a lot more monolithic than you'd think, and and people are expecting a lot more sequencing there, a lot more um, uh, a lot more horizontal joints to deal with, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, they're very happy with that, um, and uh, and the owners very happy. I spoke with Tabor recently, and they're they're quite happy with it. We've had some other people out to see the site. So, um, this is uh, Camden Point, Missouri. It's a water tower. It's just structural, so uh, it's just holding the um, the tank at the top. Uh, but you can see they used a, kind of like some slip forming equipment, but essentially used octaform, and they um, uh, they cast it in uh, uh, twelve foot segments all the way up, uh, roughly speaking. I can't remember what the top segment was, but um, but essentially they they did twelve foot segments, and they just what they did is the inside panel and the outside panel are the same height, and then the uh, the connector is higher, so you you know have got something to kind of connect the next piece to. Um, and then every time, you know, if you're doing SSAR SLT system and you're doing a really high, like a big digester, you don't want the cold joint and the concrete at the same point, that, at the same height that the cold joint and the form is because our form gives you some added assurance. So you actually stop your pour about a foot below, you place a water stop in there. And then when you go to do your next pour, your next pour drops in a foot past. Uh, so you don't have a cold joint right in front of that seam. And then obviously you're going to, 
try and get that seam as low as you can in the tank. So if you've got two segments, you're gonna put it way down below the gas zone. So you'll actually choose where the seam is gonna be. Uh, and then and then you can lap it with polyurethane as well. So, um, so that's that CR and our uh, waste services I talked about. They're getting 4 million diesel gallon equivalent of uh, fueling out of that. Um, and they're gonna go ahead with us for a second phase that'll double the size to so the 335,000 tons of ICNI and food waste. And it's, it's kind of neat when you go down and it, I, I had, it, it predates me and I was down in LA County and I'm on the road and all of a sudden every truck around you see on our R&R &R and you realize just how much how much waste they're putting hauling to that facility. It's a pretty impressive facility. So, so yeah, it's a neat one. It's, you know, one, it was, it's been around a while now and, and it's uh, fairly well known uh, in the, in the uh, AD space anyway. Uh, this is Seacliff Energy. It's a, a mixed waste uh, facility as well. Um, and they've done, they did the initial two tanks with us. Then we relined that hydrolysis tank, which we talked about. Uh, they just did a third um, uh, primary EDD with us last year. Uh, they switched on that design. They went to a um, uh, suspended slab roof. Uh, and I, and I, I don't know the rationale behind that, but uh, uh, certainly, you know, you do get a, most of your heat loss through the 80% through the of your heat loss is through the double membrane. So in some markets, there may be a rationale to do suspended slab because you're gonna obviously get way better thermal performance. Um, there's some other equipment that relies on the suspended slab roof as well. Um, so this is that uh, hydrolysis tank, which we looked at. Uh, this is a neat one. It's Seabreeze Farms. It's in Delta, BC. Um, you know, pretty small. You normally wouldn't see an upgrader on that one. Uh, but it was just to, uh, it was just kind of our, our, you know, it was early days. And I think there was, there was some support from government to, to get a, uh, a you know, from uh, Fortis to get a, a, you know, some gas injection going. Um, so it's like a 170 cal uh, dairy and they've got, um, uh, and they're, they're running a digester there and, and upgrading and doing gas injection for uh, RNG production. Uh, we did Canada's first zoo gas plant. This is a pretty cool project. Uh, so it's a mixed waste. Um, you know, from an energy intensity standpoint, most of the value of the, well, mostly from an RNG standpoint is generating from food waste because uh, it's, you know, it's obviously more, much more energy intensive, uh, but they are collecting, uh, you know, elephant poop, zebra poop, you name it. It's all going in there. And, uh, and then they're mixing it with food waste. Uh, they got ICNI waste coming in from a variety of sources. So um, some uh, typical commercial haulers, as well as, as anything they're producing at the zoo uh, is going in there as well. So food waste, ICNI, um, uh, fog, fat soils and greases. So. Uh, and in the Midwest, we do see a lot of these additional ancillary buildings getting built as well. Um, probably some opportunity for list stations as well. Uh, we bid a few, haven't seen any come in yet, but obviously you do hear about a lot of corrosion in, in there and you can essentially cast the entire, you know, all the tanks and, and it's particularly in small tanks. Uh, it's quite time intensive for the contractors to figure out how to strip the forms out of there. Um, whereas ours are just leaving place. So, uh, so that can help. And then uh, they cast the, you know, the entire well system of the structure as well. Um, questions and then we'll move to uh, uh, the fun part. You get to build something. So, uh, so seeing as we're going to build something, I got to give a safety talk first, I guess. That's how it goes. So, um, I didn't bring my hard hat. I did last year, uh, but um, uh, it's not going over your head. So, I think we'll be okay. Um, I, I joke a lot, but obviously, safety is a big, big concern in our in our company. Um, doesn't matter who we're working with. You know, if something comes up, we're going to talk about it. Uh, so, um, you know, you might manage to cut yourself with octaform, but. That's, that's about all we need to worry about today. So, um, and we're not handling any rebar and we're not gonna grind. I was thinking of bringing a grinder and actually grinding some rebar here, but thought that might be objectionable. So we're not gonna do that today. So uh, I'm just gonna show everyone uh, kind of what components we're gonna do. Last year, uh, we just kind of showed generally how you do a simple uh, containment application. Um, and in that assumption, we assumed, uh, we didn't use our SLT panel. So that just assumes the governing factor is, is essentially an ACI 350 design. I would just, you know, wanted to kind of illustrate something simple. And that can happen. Sometimes you'll get a, a design like that Aeromod tank with all those walls. Uh, it would be too time intensive. So the main advantage was the time. Uh, so the, the governing factor for the, the performance of the structure was still the code, ACI 350. And the forming system they were using was the standard Octaform forming system. But in most cases, if you're doing a round containment tank, uh, we're going to provide that 20-year warranty on it. We're going to use that SLT panel. So today we're going to build a digester. 
So I'll just show you kind of what the components are for the digester. Thanks very much. What is that, two inches? About two inches. Yeah. So, so, um, so there's four major components. We have a, uh, the first thing that's gonna go up when you build a tank, as you, we saw in those videos, is this SLT panel. So what happens on the ground is that uh, unless there's major winds, uh, they're typically gonna, gonna make an 18 inch segment of this. So they're gonna take three of these six inches and on, a, on the ground on top of a, the crates that we ship them in, they're gonna have a crew of you know two or three people uh, pull them out and then they're gonna uh, essentially uh, slide them together. So they'll put them on a 45 degree angle like that, slide them along. If it's a really big tank, like, a, you know, you get to 40 feet lengths, they're, they're not going to be able to do that because it's going to get kind of flimsy and awkward, but up to 20 feet, they're just going to literally slide it on from the end. If it's a larger tank, they're going to kind of put it together like this, like a tent. They're going to have a few more people on it and they're going to put it together like a tent. And then it ends up either way at the end, you end up with the, with this piece flat on top of the crate. And then they run that zipper tool down it and that closes it. We're not going to worry about that today because it's only a foot long, which means amazingly, you can kind of press it together. You step on it. And uh, and then you've got your, your SLT panel joint uh, see, sealed. Uh, sometimes people, you know, they want to see that joint. That seems so sometimes we extrude it with a, a blue. So some of the panels you'll see here have that blue a co extruded gasket. It's more kind of for illustrative purposes, but you can see where the contact points are. Uh, if you guys, when you come up and want to study that. So now I've got, you know, two, um, two panels. And, uh, and then on the outside, I'm going to have on the outside, our, our goal is speed, obviously, right? Doesn't need to be watertight on the outside. So you're going to use uh, two of our standard panels. So the way the sequencing would work normally in a, in a project is you would, I don't know if everyone can see this, You'd essentially wreck this. It would get braced against, you know, uh, panels sets of three would get braced against the formwork or against the bracing, and then you would slide in um, an octiform connector. And so they would end up sliding in all the the octiform connector every six inches. Or every three, depending on the, the thickness of the tank. So, um, so then you end up with something like that. And then the outside panels go on quite easily. So they'll just slide down. So usually, uh, say you do a 100-foot diameter tank, the last day of the project, uh, you can picture if they're much larger, they'd have them over their shoulders, they'd line them up, drop them down. And you can see video where they drop them down kind of, you know, it's usually about eight feet, it's almost eight feet per uh, per second, right? So literally the last day of the project, someone's running around closing up the form. Um, in, in the reality for a, for a project in the field, sorry, I misaligned my stuff here. Um, hard to do on this little thing here. Anyway, I think we, we're getting the point here. So um, uh, in a project in the field, it would kind of be almost just the last day of the project. So we'll be running around for for uh, you know one to two man days just closing that form. So um, oh sorry, I know what I was going to say. So so the the what happens in the in the actual sequencing in the field is that the the entire formwork is braced with without these outside panels on, and so everyone has access you know immediate easy access for rebar placement. They can place it, they can lift it, they can tie it. It'll get inspected by the engineer, and and away you go. So and then finally the last day you you close up. Your close-up exercise, say if you're doing a digester and it's insulated, you're going to have a crew of two run around sliding down the outside panels, and then they're going to slide down this insulation. I, just for simplicity's sake, I didn't bring it. There's these little clips that kind of jam in there, and they're almost like a fish hook. They have a, a flange on them, and that, that ensures that they stick. Uh, they, th that lines up with this little track here, and that ensures that, that they don't fall into the concrete when the concrete's getting placed. But for simplicity's sake, I didn't, I didn't bring that. But 
this is effectively what a digester tank looks like. So here we are. I don't know if you can get the camera in this level or not. If not, I'll bring it up. Um, so this is essentially a digester cross section. So you can see where the structural concrete would go um, and, and where the insulation would go. The EPS is like four, R four and a half per inch. So in this case, you're getting an R9. A lot of times you're gonna see a four inch spec and then that would be like an R18, which would be pretty typical for uh, kind of Canada or, or even the Midwest, US Midwest or what have you for, for an AD tank anyway. So, um, so that's it. So uh, there's a bit of a contest. Uh, if you guys can just uh, figure out how to align yourselves into into two teams, uh, and and um, I'm gonna uh, I won't do timer because I don't. This is an experiment. I don't know exactly how long you're gonna take, but um, we'll get you guys to build a, a segment of six, um, and uh, and whoever whatever team wins, we'll send you an Amazon gift card for fifty bucks for each team member. So there's some incentive. Hey, a few people woke up. All right. So, um, so how many how many do we have here? Maybe, yeah, I think we'll do three teams. So, if you guys want to just uh, get get three teams, get friendly if you don't know each other, you should. So, and I'll uh, break up materials here. So we'll do three teams, and uh, your goal here is uh, uh, just do segments of five. So, so five five complete segments with insulation in there. Uh, the trucks on the way. Yeah, it's slow. They're slow. Yeah. yeah. Stuck in traffic. Yeah, they are. Yeah. So let's do. Uh, I must have one more piece here. There we go. All right. So team leads, grab some insulation, and then I'll get you guys panels as well. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want you want to give your trade secrets away. So make sure you're far, far enough away they can't hear you. Thirds? Yeah, how many do you got there? Yeah. There you go. There you go. There's six of the inside of the outsides. And then you'll need uh, uh, six. You'll need seven connectors each. Two, four, six, seven. There you go, sir. And then just six each of these. So you need six of these. Two, four, six. There you go, sir. These are the outside. That's the inside. Yeah. So are they the same? These ones are the same as those. No, this is the this is the uh, the watertight one. That's the one that's a little trickier. So I'll help you guys with that if you can't connect it. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, six of each. Well, these ones are are a little bit more fancy. So you need six of those. How many do you have there? Uh, looks like you got a few. Yeah, you you can cheat. You can use mine. So there you go. It looks like you got. There you go. There's six. So you're good on those. Uh, yeah. We're. I think we're good. Everyone's got materials. Everyone's got hands-on materials. So. Oh yeah, I was wondering whether I'm gonna give give people tips or not. So I guess I'll give you a tip. So remember, I showed you the inside, and then I said the outside goes on really easy. Yes. So the in so the inside panels are the SLT that he's got. The outside panels don't actually stick to themselves; they stick to the connector. Yeah. Hey, so, I don't have the inside panels. So, yes. So I would build your inside wall first. Might as well do it the way we erect it, and then. Yeah. And then, yeah, you got it. This is awesome. Hey, can you uh, just occasionally jump out of the way when he's videoing? Yeah, just occasionally, just so he can pick up on something. You guys figuring it out? Looks like it. Do you definitely have uh, two different pieces? That looks like... 
Damn. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about color so much as just uh Oh, that's definitely it. Gotta hold the mouse right. Why does that look weird? Get it up here. No, it's the other way. Is it? No, I'm confused. Why am I confused? Because that goes the other way. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's there. You go. Do you want to? Uh, do you want to do any field support? One more panel on the end. I was going to set like that. Oh yeah, so these guys, I'll give you a hint. They they don't really connect to each other at all. They connect to the connectors. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, there you go. There you go. Going us on your team. Maybe going for And then, and then one of the tips is obviously there's there's more than you can put them up to three inches. Um, so you're just going to put them six inches so the so that the insulation fits. The photo goes to the inside or the outside. This one and this one. Yeah, it formal on the outside. So if this is this is the fluid side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then you got structural concrete, and then you got insulation. And you get the next. Everyone being safe. There more inside like outside uh there should be did i do my counts wrong should be good yeah. it's gonna get an angle on everyone are you <laughs> oh because they're winning yeah Apparently, now that you guys are winning, uh, there's people who want to join your team. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Okay. Don't tell anyone. Yay! Nicely done. Good teamwork. That's Friday. Yeah, ICFs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, in Australia, they use they use uh, this stuff for everything. Um, yeah, it's just kind of taken off. They're good. I, I mean, I think the main concern is even though uh, we're Class A fire and smoke after that Grenfell Towers thing in the UK, I, I don't know that we're going to chase that. I think we just we'd be fighting confirmation bias and everything else. And, yeah. We use them for a low density fill on uh, bridges on and off ramps. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You would the, the yeah, the foam, yeah. yeah. Some kind of high density foam cube, yeah. Yeah. I was, wor I was working at ArmTech when they did the PMH1 and they, they did all that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm James. Yeah. Oh, Danny. Danny, that's me. <laughs> cool, James. Ryan, and I have a sprained wrist. Oh, Ryan. I'll be very careful. It's a, a very me. soft shape. Yeah. I took the thing off. How'd you do that? Ah, uh, awesome. Yeah. Oh, should have seen the other guy. Oh, that's good. <laughs> no, I just right? fell on it awkward and put my hand up. I it was when you were at work. Yeah. <laughs> Nicely done, guys. I, I got to take a picture of this. I'll let them know we got some more field support people here. What's that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah.
Nicely done, guys. Maybe we'll have to have a runner-up prize. You guys did pretty well. Yeah, yeah, they'll they'll uh, they can change both, so they can pretty much deliver any radius. And then um, you'll notice, like even these panels, we have different variations of of, um, of this panel as well. Where you can like, if you cut it right here, it becomes two three-inch panels, right? So they can see how that that's like essentially a, one of these. So we and then we have this other one called the PF five multi, and it's got even more increments, so it builds everything like one one and a half, two two and a half, it becomes two two and a half, uh, three three and a half, like all the way up in half-inch increments. So which is also good because at the end you got to figure out how to close the tank. So yeah. we always tell them when they get to when they get to ten feet, keep measuring, and keep calculating what pieces you're going to use to close it. So. Yeah. So yeah, but any radius, like right down to ten feet. Yeah, just uh, you know, estimating will kind of issue a different design. Sometimes they'll uh, they'll issue a design where it's like it'll go seven seven three seven seven three or whatever, using a combination to to keep the radius. And so they'll expect that. On the oh the reline, yeah, two and a half inches. Yeah, so it's five inches in total diameter, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. No, Abbotsford. Cool. Things are busy there, aren't they? Oh, really? Oh, man. Well, we can talk. We get to get. We can't. We don't really have five inches. Oh, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's where it becomes challenging. But uh, certainly when they when they do, it works well. No oh, central Okanagan. Yep. Yeah. yeah, just because we're <laughs> below, oh sorry, we were not below it. So okay. Just, uh, cool. Yeah, it's your opportunity. There's a contractor there that keeps calling me. <laughs> keeps saying I want to do something with you guys. I mean, there's a lot of uh, I think there's a lot of potentially firewater tanks and that sort of thing going in as well. Yeah, so. Yeah. yeah, we can wrap. Yeah. So, hey, do you guys have a team name that's uh, appropriate? Team what? Team winner. All right. So, yeah, I want to say, say team giver. So, I want to say congrats to team giver for, uh, you know, a, an excellent performance. So, if you guys are ever, you know, looking for a job in the field, I can send you off to Iceland in the winter. The, the wind, it only blows 140 kilometers an hour on a, on a bad day there. So. I think he's accusing you of being low, low yeah. scale. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I really appreciate everyone for, for taking their time today. Uh, great conference and, and great group as all as always. Um, obviously, we, we do run uh, uh, technical sessions. Uh, happy to, to give a lunch and learn to, to anyone who's, who's keen. And, and um, uh, we do provide fairly detailed level one budgetary pricing as well. So you don't need to kind of. Uh, we can usually turn something around in a couple of days if you're just looking for a certain tank dimension, what it would cost. Um, you know, if there's even a volume ex optimization exercise, we can volume optimize and come back with something for you. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks. Please join me in uh, thanking James. Uh, so that, that wraps our in-person uh, sessions. I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, I'm going to invite Stephanie Hall from EOCP up to just give a little closing thing for us, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, that was a great session. It was good to see everyone interacting as well and what came out of it. That was great. Um, this is just a reminder that we've got the Women of Water tomorrow, um, 8 a.m. start in person for breakfast. And those attending virtually, it will be at 9 a.m. Um, and then just a reminder as well, because it was such a great uh, event. Uh, the dates for next year is September the 9th to the 11th. So hope to see you next year. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.